Hi, this is Ali. Thank you for joining me for this episode of the Roost Files Unite podcast. Before we start the episode proper, I just wanted to give you a heads up that the sound quality on my half of the conversation this time round isn't as good as I would have liked. This was due to a problem with some background noise which needed editing out, and consequently my vocal is not as sharp as it might have been. I think I've managed to identify the cause of the problem, so it shouldn't be an issue on future episodes. In the meantime, I hope this won't affect your enjoyment of this one too much. All right, having got that little announcement out of the way, on with the show. to the Rus Files Unite podcast, where we watch Russian films and films with a Russian connection. As always, I am joined by a guest, and uh, today my guest is Spencer. Hi, Spencer. Thank you for joining me. Oh, you're welcome. How are you, Alistair? I'm doing all right. How, how are you, Spencer? I'm doing pretty good. Cool. Yeah. Um, can you tell me a bit more about yourself? Well, um, I've always been kind of obsessed with Russian history. Don't remember how it happened exactly, but when I was in fifth grade, and I, I would I started reading the encyclopedia for fun, and I just like spend hours just reading different stuff from encyclopedia, and I just like gravitated towards Russian history for some reason, and it got to a point where I taught myself the uh, written Russian alphabet. And I memorized it, and I tried to teach myself the grammar. And this was when I was 12, and that didn't really go well, because Russian grammar is uh, challenging, to put it lightly. Oh, believe me, I, I, I know from painful personal experience. But um, I guess that's that's the thing when you're 12. You, it doesn't occur to you that that's going to be insanely difficult. You just go, oh, I, I fancy doing that. Yeah, like I knew all the all the characters in the written alphabet and I could like write them out. And I, I, I think that's about as far as I got. And then I taught my, I taught myself uh, every czar in order. That is no mean feat. That and um, including the uh, Soviet dictators too. Gotcha. No, that's, that's really cool and pretty, pretty impressive. I mean, I think I would struggle to, to name all of the, um, well, English and then um, British monarchs. I think I could possibly do it, but there, would, but there would be gaps. So to be able to do that for another country, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, I've forgotten a lot of it because it's been over a decade, but... Sure. In junior high, I was a pretty cool kid. Right. I could tell you about False Dimitri, one through three. <laughs> Yeah, I, I remember that coming up on the episode of um, your podcast, uh, High and Low, that I guessed on. You You kind of uh, blindsided me by asking me <laughs> which my favorite czar was. I think I said, uh, I don't know. I think they were all pretty <laughs> pretty awful. But yeah, uh, so so right back at you. Do you have a favorite czar? Um, yes, it's Sophia, who was Peter the I, or the Great, uh, his older half-sister, who was the regent before he was old enough to be czar. So, so what was it about her that appealed? Uh, well, she pretty much started all like the uh, government reforms that Peter gets all the credit for. Like he, uh, she, she had the first college built in Russia during her reign. She revamped and just tried to straighten out like the uh, Boyer system and uh, tried to. This make it more modern and more appealing to the rest of Europe, so you won't be seen as like the backwards country, because they were seen as like the like backwards, like rednecks. And is redneck a term over there? Um, it's one we understand. Um, just you know, lots of uh, uh, exposure to American culture. I'm trying to think like what the equivalent would be without saying something massively offensive. <laughs> But sort of backwards, unsophisticated, like country bumpkin type. Yeah, and so yeah, and Sophia started all that, and then Peter kind of ousted her because he got a lot of support, and he became of age, and 
She never married or had kids, but she had a lover who was a uh, the head general, but he lost favor because they lost too many battles, and uh, she kind of died in obscurity in a convent. Yeah, she's she's one that we tend not to have not to have heard of in in the West. Um, someone I think is really cool who was Peter's second wife. I, I want to say who was actually Catherine the first. So not Catherine the Great because that's Catherine the second, but she was really really interesting. Uh, the, the BBC did a uh, radio drama series about the different uh, Russian czars and. Uh, She was really, really very formidable. She actually, uh, at least the way the drama portrayed it, she was uh, essentially like a domestic servant who was spotted by one of uh, Peter's best friends and courtiers. And he probably noticed her appearance before anything else um, because she was Peter's type. Apparently she was very attractive. Um, But he also, once he got to know her, he he figured that she was incredibly smart um, as as well. I mean, at least at least again in the in the drama, she she wasn't a native Russian mm-hmm. speaker, but taught her, herself to speak uh, Russian very very quickly. Um, I'm looking at Wikipedia, which might be not uh, so correct, but apparently she was Polish and Lithuanian. Yes, yeah, that's 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 right. That's what I understood from from this radio series i don't think it's i think it would probably be pretty hard to find as i don't think it's on, online anymore but i don't know maybe it's on on audible or something or will be at some point i guess uh yeah at this point you, you sort of say oh yes or audible you should you should sponsor us seeing as you sponsor all of the other podcasts uh but uh, yeah not high and low yet not yet uh but uh yeah you have to have to figure figure out like a, a sort of a book tie-in or something I know there are a couple Kurosawa books. Have, have I brought up that I have a Kurosawa podcast? Um, well, I sort of glancingly uh, mentioned that I guested on, on, on your podcast, but I didn't really explain what that was. So uh, uh, maybe you should explain that in, in your own words. Oh, yeah. So I have a separate podcast called High and Low, a Kurosawa podcast named after the Kurosawa film High and Low, where me and my co-host Stroll We pick a Kurosawa movie and another Japanese movie from that same year. And we do two separate episodes, kind of talking about each one and comparing them. And, you know, seeing what's interesting and what isn't. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's pretty easy. It's on Criterion or whatever. And sometimes it means like spending like 30 bucks on import DVD. So This being a Russian film podcast, I I feel your pain on the import uh, DVD front. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, until I started listening to your podcast, I had I had no idea quite how prolific uh, Kurosawa had been. You know. Oh yeah. How many films did he do in the end? It's debated, but uh, mm. thirty three or thirty two, because his first film, the director quit towards the end, and so Kurosawa had to finish it. But his name isn't attached to it because he only finished like the last third or so and there's another movie a propaganda film he did where it was different segments and he wanted his name taken off of it and the film has never been released like officially but it's called a Kurosawa film by some people so there are a couple kind of uh, questionable ones in the mix sort of fall in a, a weird sort of limbo zone yeah Okay. Oh, cool. Um, and of course, he one of his, I guess, like lesser known films these days uh, was actually a, a shot in the Soviet Union. Uh, yeah, Der, uh, Der Suit was Allah. It's um, a memoir by. I got look it up. He was a a Russian explorer who um, uh, he was uh, uh, what do you call it when you're trying to like make a map of an area oh yes um like explorer is not is not sufficient like cartographer yeah something like that surveyor surveyor that's it and um anyway i can't remember it but it's a so it's a book that came out i think after soviets took over in the 20s called um 
I guess translates to Dare Sue the Trapper or the Hunter. It, the English translations are, are always all over the place. But he ran to this this like Mongolian Russian man who uh, just kind of lived in the forest and helped them survey the land. And then five years later, he surveyed Siberia. The captain uh, surveyed Siberia again, a different part, and kind of runs into this this trapper again. And they, it's just the story of their friendship and their adventure. And uh, it's a kind of a sad story because he ends up getting shot by a, a thief in a, I forgot what city, but he ends up living with the... It's probably Khabarovsk or somewhere like that. Yeah, like there, Sue ends up living with the, the captain because he can't hunt anymore because he's going blind and uh, he ends up getting shot. It's all historical, so it's not really a spoiler. And he sure. gets shot by a thief because he gets given like a fancy new gun with better eyesight. Like, I, I don't know what you call I don't know guns. Like, the thing that... It's not a scope. Yeah, like a cyborg. Yeah. I don't know. Guns are not really really a thing I know I know too much about either. But, uh, yeah, I guess you could say it wouldn't wouldn't really be a, a Russian set film if it wasn't slightly depressing. So, uh, although that's perpetuating a terrible stereotype. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, that also brings up the whole issue of what's perhaps poorly understood in, in the West is that Russia, like, like most places, it's not... Um, ethnically homogenous but but i think people don't realize just quite how diverse russia is just because it's this mm-hmm. huge like multi-ethnic empire it just has the, the label russia slapped on it and you kind of mm-hmm. think oh well russia so everyone is russian um, not necessarily some people look very mongolian but they are still russian exactly yeah and then of course you had the whole mongol yoke business so you had the Russians being ruled over by the uh, successors of uh, of Genghis Khan and the uh, Golden Horde. Uh, yeah, indeed. Yes, uh, I'm tempted to make some some joke about uh, not being able to um, make a, a a Mongol yoke without breaking some eggs. But <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I think I think the the subject of today's film would probably have me brutally uh, tortured or something for for making a joke that bad. Um, <laughs> And so, yeah, that uh, awkward link <laughs> to the film that we're watching. Uh, so today we're, we're going to be watching Tsar, and the subject of, uh, of that film is Ivan the Fourth, or as he's better known, Ivan the Terrible. Or Ivan Grozny. Oh, very good, very good. Um, but terrible is a terrible translation, because I've seen it as it means formidable or strong, not terrible. I'm I'm really glad you you brought that up because it's definitely one that needs to needs to be brought up. Yeah, terrible in sort of like an older sense of the word, but like you say, mm-hmm. yeah, it doesn't really capture it because terrible tends yeah just tends to suggest that he was just a really bad dude, which is part of it. But yeah, the the sense of the Russian word is more like as you say, formidable. I mean, I've s- sometimes seen him called Ivan the Dread, which mm-hmm. is a good one. Um, That's pretty metal. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, another English translation that wouldn't work very well with modern English is Ivan the Awesome, because you just think it's really cool. Yeah, well, it means awesome in the old-timey, like, biblical sense. Yeah, like the prostrate yourself in fear, um, or else. Yeah. So, uh, what do you know about uh, about Ivan? Um, he's the first crowned czar, his grandfather, Ivan the Ivan III, or Ivan the Great, who freed the Russians from the Golden Horde. Although the Golden Horde was pretty weak by that point, and kind of a joke. But um, his grandfather was the first Russian to use the title Tsar in like official papers and stuff like that. And to refer to himself, but he kind of stole it from the... I think started in Bulgaria. Okay. The, the word Tsar. It kind of well, it kind of spread from Central Europe to Eastern Europe, and uh, when Ivan was crowned, he, in his coronation, referred to himself as Tsar, and so he's considered the first Tsar. But that's technically not that true, but kind of is true, because like Russia was just a series of like city states, kind of that are loosely connected for a long time, so it's kind of unclear when it became. Like, you know? Yeah, oh, oh, 
definitely, because I mean, somewhere like somewhere like where I'm from, we had a period of being lots of separate places that eventually united into a one kingdom, but that happened a lot longer ago than our history tends to cover. So most people just go, oh, England, and then, you know, Scotland and Wales joined. But yeah, basically, it's it's been the same place forever. But yeah, Russia had a bit more of a complicated recent history, I guess. Um, so yeah, I'm, I was just thinking about other, histor- you know, films about historical figures that are actually good. Uh, I'm actually struggling to come up with with a ton um there's um the uh the guy who directed Patton directed before that i think it was before Patton nicholas and alexandra which is based off of the uh, is his name lincoln or bruce like he the there's this really famous um uh book on nicholas and alexandra uh and the fall of the romanovs and as a three-hour epic with Tom Baker in it as Rasputin from the seventies of Doctor Who fame. Yeah, yeah. Before before we uh, we started recording, uh, Spencer was telling me that it was a bit of a uh, a bit of a revelation as far as uh, as far as Tom Baker is concerned. Yeah, I didn't really know he can act beyond being like a a goofy Doctor Who, but in this movie from I think nineteen seventy, he plays uh, uh, Rasputin. Cool. Well, that is definitely one on the on the list to be to be watched um, in future. And it, it is a good movie. Just it's a big three hour epic. Yeah, it's a bit of a time commitment. I mean, the the one we're watching today, um, which is it's quite a recent one. It's from two thousand and nine, and it's directed by Pyotr uh, Mamonov. Um, it's it's just a couple of hours, so it's kind of it's kind of manageable. Yeah. Cool. Um, what we'll do is we'll watch the film and then we'll compare notes so uh, what we do uh, every time is i uh, force my guests to speak a bit of russian but it sounds like you, you're you're better prepared uh, than than some spencer so um well you hear a real sweet spot for me because this is a uh, my favorite era of russian history oh fantastic well i'm glad to hear that well the phrase we say has a much more modern connection and well it's not even a phrase it's a word and the word is payekhali payekhali that's pretty good. Um, and the significance of Payekhali is, is what Yuri Gagarin said when he was blasting off to become the first man in space. So it's kind of about as famous in Russia as one small step for man, that, that phrase. Oh. But it's much more prosaic because it essentially just means mm-hmm. here we go or we're yeah. off or something like that. <laughs> okay, so after three... One, two, three. Payakhali. Payakhali. Welcome back. We've just watched Tsar, and now we're going to talk about uh, what we thought about it. But first, uh, a quick summary of the plot from uh, Spencer. So, Spencer, take it away. All right. So it starts in 1565, and it basically covers the end of uh, Ivan the Fourth's friendship with uh, this bishop turned. Uh, was it Metropolitan? Yep. Which I'm, I guess, is like they're kind of like the Pope figure for the Russian Orthodox Church. Yeah, pretty, pretty much. I mean, I, I can't really go into Russian Orthodox mm-hmm. Church hierarchy as I really don't understand it all that well. But yeah, it, he's he's pretty much the, the the top guy in the Russian Orthodox Church. Okay, so the parents covers uh, his friendship and his. Uh, I guess uh, betrayal of his like his only real friend uh, Philip, and it this goes for about a year, year and a half, until Philip's death, and uh, this kind of uh, uh, 
what was the the land that uh, Ivan was like his personal land? The Aprichnina, if I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah, I think, and then like all the people who live there abandon him, and this ends on this very bleak note of him feeling betrayed by everyone. Yeah, as we've probably already sort of conveyed in that summary, not the cheeriest of films. No. Um, did you like it just to just to start off? I I did like it. It was very well made. I liked the pacing of it. It didn't I, I didn't feel the two hours. Um, good casting, except for uh, Ivan. Right. Because uh, at the time, Ivan would have been late thirties. Yes. Yeah. I was I was going to bring this up because. I actually had to to look back up what time in the rain this was supposed to happen, and yeah, as as you say, uh, the the guy playing Ivan is a is a much is a much older man. Yeah, almost actually, uh, yeah, almost double the age Ivan would have been at the time. Yeah, and and he didn't even make it past. I, Ivan died at fifty five. That's right. Yeah, it kind of it's kind of weird casting someone in their sixties to play a thirty. Like a thirty-nine-year-old. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, on the other hand, for me, it's a really, really good performance. And I think now, kind of going back and going, ah, oh, right, that's supposed to be the middle of his reign rather than mm. the end. It does make me go, uh, that sort of slightly detracts. But it's a shame because, as I say, he's he's really good. At least, at least I thought so. Yeah, it, it, he really captured how Ivan was a very complex, uh, multifaceted person. Because, like, pop culturally, he's thought of as, like, a crazy dictator. But he actually was, like, intensely religious. He had a warm side. He, like, he was also, like, a very personal, like, affable person at times. Like, you see all sides of him and, like, his clear mental illness and him being, like, really sweet around children. Like, it's, it's a really good performance. Like, he can just switch modes, like, on a dime. Yeah, and he, he is required to do a, a lot of different things. As, as you say, there's this, uh, there's this one little girl that comes in and out of the story, and he is just, you know, like a, an affectionate um, grandfather, and, and she even calls him uh, grandfather. Um, and he's really nice to her, but uh, as you say, he's... The, the way the film portrays him is is clearly suffering like um, a pretty intense uh, mental illness, and I, I don't know about you. I mean, I felt quite sorry for him, which is which is a, a bit of a, a weird thing to say, seeing as uh, some of the horrible things he does and mm-hmm. are kind of done in his name. But I don't know about you. I I got the feeling that he was being somewhat exploited by some of the people around him. I don't know what you think. Well, that was that was basically his whole life because his father died when he was five, and then his mother kind of didn't raise him. And um, like the Boyers, you should probably explain who the Boyers are. It's just the other royal families, uh, more or less, like the royal council. Yeah, the sort of the, the nobility. Yeah, and um, basically the Boyers in power would uh, like only uh, take him out whenever. There'd be like foreign uh, royalty visiting to keep up appearances, but they'd like lock him in his room, and like they would beat him and they won't feed him for almost, like it was just a horrible childhood. Yeah, and um, it's clear that like that contributed to his paranoia, and he probably was already mentally ill or had like the uh, the signs of it, and that made it worse. Oh yeah. Yeah, the the fact that he's in a in a position of of power and where you've got all these different interests kind of vying for for sort of influence really doesn't help. Um, in terms of the supporting characters, there's it's it's almost like this sort of madness is swirling around Ivan, and it's it's kind of you've got a mixture with some of the counselors or people around him are just clearly like more crazy and unhinged than than he is like uh, there's one guy who's uh, I think it's called Vassian like the bald guy 
Um, oh, with the scar on his cheek? Um, I don't remember the scar so much. Um, he he's the bald guy with like really really grotty, nasty nasty teeth. Oh yeah, yeah, that guy. Yeah, he's he's really quite memorable. I mean, I've actually seen this this film before today, but it was a long time ago, and I'm really surprised that more of it hadn't stuck with me. But he's mm-hmm. he's just really crazy, and he's sort of he's almost almost kind of like a like an animal, um, and and also. Uh, Ivan's wife, um, one of the uh, seven that he had, so he went one better than, than our Henry the Eighth. Yeah, seven or eight. And the, uh, the, uh, official rules of the Russian Orthodox Church was you can be married four times, but Ivan clearly didn't care and kept on marrying. Yeah, you'd kind of think that after four, you'd, you'd go, right, mm-hmm. that's probably, that's probably enough. Maybe, it, maybe it's, uh, uh, maybe it's you, not them. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, yeah. And what did you think of, of the way she was portrayed? Uh, based off what little I know about her, is pretty accurate. That was his mm. second wife. His first wife, he was truly in love with, and they had, I think, three children. And they had a, a healthy son who was groomed to be in the next in line. And then in 1560. They were uh, leaving from something to back to their palace, and they fell in like a frozen river. And his son and wife died, and that mm. kind of was the major thing that made him snap and kind of turned him into like what we see him in this movie. Yeah. And and his second wife, people didn't want him to marry her because. She was uh, a, a quote pagan, but really she she was a daughter of a Muslim. Uh, let's see words like Khan or like local ruler. Yeah, something like that, and uh, no one really liked her. Yeah, and certainly the way she's portrayed in this film is, I mean, not quite as as mad as uh, uh, Vassian, but um, but she's. You know, you never see her have a normal conversation with anyone. She's always kind of no. like, I think the first, the first time you 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 see, mm-hmm. she's kind of like groveling to him and sort of, you know, like kissing him up and down his clothing. It's not like it's a love scene or anything like that. It is just she's sort of, I don't know, groveling. And then later on, you see various different scenes where she's just beating people. She's almost a bit like, this is a bit of a weird comparison, but I don't know if you've seen the James Bond film, um, Goldeneye. Um, I barely remember it. Do you remember the Xenia on a top character who sort of gets off on killing people? She sort of reminded me a bit, a bit of that mm. in that she's, she seems to enjoy being cruel to people in, in a sort of slightly like sexual or sensual way. At least that's how it came across to me. So that was, that was a bit weird. Um, yeah, yeah, like she was apparently illiterate and just a mean person. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I guess illiteracy back then was you know, pretty pretty common. But yeah, uh, she does she does not get a she is not portrayed in a particularly flattering way uh, at all by by this film. Oh no. In terms of uh, of the of the other characters, though, um, I think the uh, the main you know. Sort of if it's a two-hander and the the, uh, mm. the other main character is, is the Metropolitan Philippe, I really liked his performance as well. Um, and I, I, I don't know what, what you thought, but a lot of the time it's he's not called upon to say very much, but you just read what's kind of going on through his face. Yeah, he's one of the few people who's trying to genuinely help Ivan, but Ivan is clearly too far gone and uh, won't really listen to him. Like, at times, he... Early on, he kind of will listen here and there, but like, by a halfway point, it's clear, like, their friendship is, you know, effectively dead. Yeah, essentially just because uh, Philip is, is, as you say, trying trying to help. And he's, he's really sort of, like, quite gentle about it. He's just saying, you know, mm-hmm. be merciful. And, and Ivan is saying, well, but I have to punish people. That's my job. That's what God has asked me to do. Um, and Philip's like, are you sure? Uh, 
Yeah. Um, and then just, yeah, you feel, I think he's the easiest character to con- sort of connect with in a, he's almost like the window into the time period because, yeah, it's hard to identify with any, anyone else just with a, mostly just behaving in an incredibly sort of cruel and, uh, you know, stereotypically medieval way, although obviously, uh, so if we want to be pedantic about it, it's, uh, we're in the sort of early modern period already. Yeah, it's, I guess the Renaissance would have been going on in Italy around this time. Oh, yeah, it's, yeah, we're well into that, that period. And there's actually a, a bit of an allusion to that at one point, isn't there, where you have um, this German kind of inventor guy. Um, oh, yeah. But he's not in it for very, very much, but initially Philip shows him these these drawings and says they're they're by Leonardo. This sort of allusion to that sort of stuff having been around, although I think okay, because he kept saying like these are from the Italian, and it didn't say it said like I guess the Russian version of uh, Leonardo in my translation, but I wasn't really sure if they're talking about uh, Da Vinci or not. I sort of assumed it was because they they just referred to him as as Leonardo. Um, so there is kind of yeah allusions to that sort of stuff having gone on, and that this isn't you know a, in an earlier period. But it just it, it's kind of good that this is a film about Russia made by Russians mm-hmm. because if it was a Western film, you'd feel like you know this is just really stereotypical kind of oh look how barbarous the russians are and how nasty life is there but it's like no this is them saying yeah this was a really awful period of time to live in yeah it's that's kind of that's their existence for kind of a while yeah um and i feel like not that they cover this at all in in the film but i think for the sake of balance we should mention that several centuries centuries before this um, in the semi-independent city-states period, things were really pretty civilized for the time. You know, they had mm-hmm. like relative amount of self-government. It wasn't like a democracy, but people had a had a say in the town uh, meetings. It kind of comes up a little bit in the in the film where um, Ivan says something to Philip about how you know it's it's really bad if the many rule, and that's why great cities in the past. Mm. He's not specifically talking about Russian cities, but I think he's talking about cities in general, fell because lots of people had a say in decisions, whereas it's much better if it's just one man rule. Yeah. That attitude carried all the way to Nicholas II. Oh yes. Yeah, he famously uh I forgot what book it was. I think it was like Nicholas, Wilhelm and Edward, three royal cousins. Yeah. From World War One. In like the, the Nicholas section, they talk about how the mere mention of like a republic or democracy would send him into like a screaming rage. Really? Okay. Yeah, he he did not want people bringing that up because he thought a parliament was a stupid idea. Yeah, yeah. Which by that point he was, I guess, not solely in the minority. Because obviously, like in in Germany, you had an emperor with quite a lot of power. But even there, I think um, the they they had like a, a elected body that had at least some kind of influence, even if uh, the Kaiser had had lots of decision making power. I feel like going back to this film specifically, though, um, it's it seems to be like a really a critique of of just autocracy and just letting. Essentially, one person have all the power. I don't know what your take on that is. Maybe it'd be more fair critique if they maybe do like a fictionalized culmination of different czars. Because mm. Ivan is clearly very mentally unstable. Sure. So it's kind of like a biased way of. It'd be, it'd be like a biased critique. Yeah. Like I saw it more as just like. Um, it's just like a type of biopic I prefer. Which is a, a set aside a a specific uh, point in time in their life and just focus on that. And this this to me was like just purely like uh, Ivan's friendship, like 
his last true, not his last true, there were some other people, but like uh, one of his most important friendships coming to an end and like this portraying this period of time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and I also feel like, I don't think I put it very well just, just now, I feel like it's also saying that for a regime to be as, as horrible as, as this film is showing it to be, mm. it's not just about one guy because there, there are these other characters. I mean, we've talked about the, the more like deranged ones, but there's mm. some pretty calculating, nasty, nasty people. Um, like you have, uh, this Basmanov guy who I think is the, the guy that with the with the scar that you that mm-hmm. you mentioned. It's it's one of those films where it's hard to say, oh yeah, it's the guy with the beard and the <laughs> long hair because that's basically everyone because the custom was you wore a beard. Yeah. Um this is pre beard tax. Yes, yes. Oh uh tell us about the beard tax. Uh Peter the first in order to modernize Russia, one thing was uh he noticed in Western Europe they don't have beards really so he instituted a beard tax so that uh the russians would look more uh western and more uh civilized yeah yeah quote unquote um and of course lots of people didn't like this because it was you know a part of their culture that you had a big beard if you're a guy so he's essentially saying yeah i know this is our culture <laughs> but um but screw that we're going to be like the europeans so that's probably one of the reasons he's not necessarily remembered all that uh, all, all that fondly. Yeah. Um, you may may or may not be aware that he doesn't tend to be called Peter the Great in in, um, mm. in Russian. He's just referred to as Peter the First. So mm. it's probably one of these eye of the beholder and you know proximity things. Yeah, because seems outside of Russia, he's usually viewed as like like their their greatest ruler. Yeah, that and. Catherine as well, Catherine the Second. Again, she just tends to be called Catherine the Second, whereas we don't even know that that's what she was. We're just going to think, oh yeah, Catherine. So presumably Catherine the First. No, Catherine the Second. Anyway, um, yeah, but but anyway, him Basmanov, the he's this kind of scarred guy, and he's he's much more manipulative. Like you have this uh, this one scene where. He's trying to get Philip to attach his his seal to all these um, these I guess death warrants or sort of condemnations. Yeah, because um, that's a battle of I'm not sure how you say it. Polish outpost they had. Yeah, Pulse. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I should have written it down, so I've just totally forgotten. But yeah, yeah. You have you have a battle about halfway through, which it's kind of hard. To say from uh, the way the film show, shows it, who exactly uh, wins, um, but yeah, rumors reach the Tsar that that uh, the city has been given up uh, to the Poles um, by the city's inhabitants, and he is not exactly thrilled with this news. Yeah, uh, this was like a huge trading uh, trading area. I think it was big big for trade, and uh, it was kind of a big deal for Ivan to get that and the he had a kind of a rivalry with the Poles. Oh yeah. Like that was like like Napoleon with England. It was Ivan and the uh, Polish kingdom. Yeah, cuz back then, you know, Russia wasn't the the big power that it would it would go on to be. There was quite a few different powers in in the region that were equally if not more powerful. So they were in a, like a really vulnerable position. Yeah. Ivan himself was half Lithuanian. I did not know that. His mother, Elena Glinskaya, was a Lithuanian princess. Mm. I mean, that, I guess that shouldn't be a massive surprise in the sense that diplomatic marriages happen sort of all the time. But yeah, that does bring an interesting dimension to it. As uh, yeah, it's sort of a recurring theme in the in the film that Russia is beset with these with these enemies, both sort of inside and um, you know, in in some ways. At least from the outside, very, you know, in reality, because you have this this big battle. But it, then yeah. that paranoia and feeling of being under threat uh, sort of extends to Ivan, you know, trying to hunt down people who from within. And it's much more ambiguous whether that's there are 
people actually plotting against him. Yeah, well, uh, it's seen multiple times that he has these, like, these intense visions from God, like, uh, instructing him. Or not, you know. Or not, yeah. It's, like, it, it would, on paper, if you, like, uh, how am I saying this? Like, the, it would seem silly, like, the idea of, like, him talking to himself in these visions, but when you see it in the movie, it's done very well. And it shows that how, how great a performance it is to show us the mania and, like, the, real, and the like religious fervor yeah. of uh, Ivan. Yeah, it's, it, it is really, really powerful. I mean, he, again, he, he has a lot of, he has a lot of, uh, of dialogue, but yeah, some of the best stuff of him is him mostly in, in silence. Um, yeah, we've, we've talked about the casting decision there of, of choosing a much older person, but just physically, he's, it's, a, it's a fantastic performance and just the way his face looks as well. Um, it reminds me a lot of the, Ilya Repin uh, painting of uh, uh, of Ivan uh, when we, we talked about uh, how he oh, yeah. murdered his son later, but it it looks very much like that painting, which I understand is is one that, that you're really fond of as well, Spencer. Yeah, um, I forgot when I, when I first saw it, but I remember in middle school for art class we had to like write like a one page paper about a painting. And everyone picked like a Da Vinci or a Monet, you know, something, someone, something more pleasant. And I picked Ivan the Terrible killing his son. Yeah, yeah. Although we should we sh- we should say for for those who haven't seen the the, the painting, it's the immediate aftermath uh, of that happening. And you've got basically Ivan is is cradling his mortally wounded son in his arms, and he's just kind of staring out at the at the viewer and he's kind of got this almost like skull like face um yeah you know and just these the just staring eyes like he's just realized the horror of what he's he's just done and it's 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 almost it, his his face is almost a bit, it reminds me a little bit of the of the scream you know obviously it's it's a very mm. different style it's much more like realistic yeah. but it has that expression of just like sheer horror and, and revulsion. Um, it's, um, hmm. yeah, and Repin is a really famous in Russia artist. I mean, not very well known in the West, but he's definitely, uh, if you like the more realist art stuff, he's worth uh, worth looking up. And that son, he would have been the next in line. And if he never killed his son, history would have turned out very differently. Yeah, um, what happened... After him was you. You got, uh, if I'm right in saying, his uh, an infant son, Fjorda, inherited the throne, and he did not mm-hmm. last very long. No, and then it was his advisor Boris. What's his name? Oh, uh, Godunov. Yeah, it was him, and he kind of took over. And then there's a whole thing with his his other son Dmitri, who mysteriously disappeared and was killed. But then there are three. People at three different times who claim they were Dimitri, all who like came a little too close to becoming Czar. Yeah, and that was this whole, whole like a whole bill of mess. Yeah, I mean, I think they even might have been temporarily recognized as um, as Tsar because you get you know when they do their their sort of calculation of the kings, they're literally on the list as false Dimitri one and false Dimitri two. So it's kind of like. Yeah, he shouldn't have been king. He clearly wasn't <laughs> the guy, but people still thought that he was at the time yeah. and then, you know, thought better of it. It's a, yeah, it's a really odd period in, in history. I mean, fasc- fascinating. I'd like to learn learn more about it, but I, I suspect we're kind of going off into the weeds at this point. Yeah. Um, but, uh, um, but this does show, like, a thing that... Uh, I mentioned that Ivan was a very complex person and... This I like that this showed that after something terrible he would do, he would go through like an intense religious phase because he like after like a huge outburst of violence, he would immediately retreat to a monastery and pray in solitude for a while. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting the way the film depicts that side of things, because 
quite often when he's talking to somebody else, he's saying, you know, very forthrightly, this is God's will. It has to be this way. And, you know, you get the impression he's totally certain. But then when you see him on his own or just or even sometimes like with crowds of people, he's kind of mm-hmm. on his knees and sort of quaking with fear and just, you know, and we've referred to it at the ending, just saying, like, God, forgive me or give me a sign or, yeah, it's, as you as you said, it's it's really affecting when you see it on screen, but probably when we're describing it, it just sounds a, a bit ridiculous, but it's mm-hmm. it's really intense and, 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 as we've said multiple times already, uh, a really a really good performance. Um, interestingly, um, the chap who plays... Uh, Ivan is, um, he, he wasn't originally, um, an actor. He initially found fame as a, a as a musician, hmm. like in, um, like, I guess late eighties. It was in a, it's probably too simplistic to call it like a Russian or Soviet hmm. punk band, but that's kind of the sort of scene that they were part of. And I think he just met the director, uh, that way. And so he, um, he'd done like a few films with this director already, which I think, uh, um, I said uh, that Pyotr uh, Mamanov, who's the actor mm-hmm. um, who plays Ivan, directed this film, but actually the director was Pavel Lungin. I should get that correction in there, but they'd worked together before. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if, if if you said that he wasn't a, originally an actor, it's, it's a little bit of a, a surprise anyway, because he's, he's really good. I was, like, I thought he was like a classically trained, like uh, Daniel Day-Lewis type, because like that performance is just so intense, and then it's like, oh, he's just like a punk guy who kind of fell into it. Yeah, yeah. But then again, I mean, I suppose it's not all that unusual for people to come from different performance backgrounds and turn out to be, you know, a fantastic, like, serious actor. I mean, a, a good example I can think of that is uh, is uh, Billy Connolly, mm-hmm. um, the, you know, primarily sort of thought of as a, a as a comedian, but. He's done, you know, quite a few serious roles. And if you didn't know that that was his background, you'd just assume that that had been his job forever. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you've seen uh, Mrs. Brown, uh, where he plays, like, the servant of Queen Victoria. I just know him for Boondock Saints. Oh, I haven't seen Boondock Saints. Um, Well, you're not 17, so don't bother. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> okay, sort of duly, duly warned. Is it sort of slightly in, uh, um, you know, capture in the rye territory that if you watch it at that age, it's good. If not, oh yeah. It's... If if you're like a a teen boy, you will love Boondock Saints. If you are older than age of twenty, the the skip it. Okay, right. I, I will I will not add that to the already uh, <laughs> uh, too long list of things I need to need to catch up on. But uh, that being said, those movies are awful, but Billy Connolly is by far the best part of those movies. Mm. Going back to, uh, to the, f- the film, like, what did you think of it just in terms of the direction and just the way, the look of the thing? We haven't really touched on that all that much. Uh, I like the production because, like, uh, I'm not an expert on the, the clothing or like the clothing of that era, but the little I, that I do know from paintings is that like it's pretty accurate, and I like the just the whole like set design and costumes. Like you can tell there was a lot of effort put into the tiniest details. Yeah, it's kind of a sumptuous production. You can tell like a lot of money was spent on it. And um, there's this one part. It's after and it opens with Ivan praying. Uh, by himself, and then it cuts to him going back to his palace and getting ready. And it's just this long tracking shot of servants dressing him, and it's just this beautiful shot that clearly shows like the the relationship of he's he has all the power, and he he literally doesn't have to do anything. Yeah, but also the fact that he has all these like regalia that's part of that, you know, is the, conveying how important he is and the cross and this icon sort of hung mm. over him. And it's just, yeah, as you say, it's a long shot and there's lots of different bits of the costume put on. And it's and then, you know, he comes out and he's this this grand figure. And it goes, it's like wearing this, originally it's wearing this tunic and it ends up in this, like, a very formal, like, royal regalia. Yeah, and you totally get why monarchies and things like that 
had all of that fancy regalia because you just have somebody in their tunic. They're not all that impressive. They're just mm. another person like you. But when you see them in you know, all this, you know, impressive gear, you're kind of like, wow, that's, that's an impressive, an impressive guy. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of babbling, but it is, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a great shot and loads of great landscape stuff as well. Um, a lot of it is, you know, very stereotypically uh, Russian and cold and snowy, but often you just got this really this contrast of the Aprichniki in their in their black mm. against like the sort of snow covered landscape, and it's it's really striking. I would have loved to have seen this at the cinema. Yeah, yeah, can't see it coming to a cinema <laughs> near me anytime soon for some reason. But uh... there is one thing I did not like. Uh, it's in the beginning where you see them killing chickens on screen. Yeah, that is that's definitely a memorable part. Yeah, I don't. I don't like seeing animals killed on screen in movies. It's this little like you can fake it. Sure, I, I don't need to see it. Yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't sure whether that was was for real or not. But oh, it, that was definitely real. Okay, because like, you see one chick, a couple of chickens, just like with their heads off, just like flapping around because like uh, they don't immediately die. They they kind of uh, they're just trying to serve. They sort of bounce, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. It, if that was, yeah, really, um, as you say, as, as you suspect, like, uh, live chickens that they use, that's really horrible. But it, and I'm not trying to justify that, but in terms of mm-hmm. showing that image, it does, I think it does tie in with, with the sort of the, the theme of the film, just senseless violence going out through it, because it's not even like they're just chopping them up to have to have them for dinner it's just like literally these these guys with swords throwing these chickens up in the air and then whacking them just <laughs> just for yeah. like for fun essentially and it's it's like yeah there's a lot of that sort of thing going on in in this in this film which i guess that could be like a uh, foreshadowing for later oh oh definitely um we should say <laughs> this this film is you probably probably gathered from what we've said already but there's a lot of really, really tough stuff. I don't know what there would have been, but over here it would be definitely a 15, I guess, an R over in the States. Uh, well, uh, apparently it's PG-13 over here, which... Really? Yeah, which feels like a mistake. It, it does. I, I wonder whether they made made a few cuts for the... Ameri- the like. I don't know whether it was ever released cinem- cinematically, but... Well, over here, probably like New York and L.A., yeah. And like that probably be it. Yeah, similar here. It would have been yeah, big cities, but but yeah, wouldn't have made it out to <laughs> where I live now. Um but yeah, it's really, really tough stuff and yeah, like you say with the chickens that's upsetting. Um I mean yeah, I've seen worse. There's a Japanese movie I cover on my podcast, uh, with Joel where you see a, a cow get slaughtered on screen mm. which is a lot uh more uncomfortable. But it's yeah, sure. But the chickens are still just—they have the mind. They, if you see, you see a production value in it. Like they could have, they could have faked that. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of you know, obviously faked cruelty through, throughout the film. I think this is definitely falls into the maybe not quite as graphic as as Game of Thrones, but um, if you kind of use that as a as a yardstick, it's kind of it's on that scale of nastiness happening i think for me like the most disturbing part is is the part with the bear oh yeah i <laughs> blotted that one out Ugh. yeah i try to forget that <laughs> yeah this is basically it's it's almost like the turning point of the film i would say so it's tricky not to give too much away but it reminded me of the uh it felt like a cos like a Coliseum Roman type thing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Which fits because um uh the Russians originally saw themselves as the next Roman Empire after the Byzantines fell. Yeah, yeah. Often they called Moscow the the third Rome and there was even like a uh, a prophecy which I think it was I could be getting these mixed up, but I think it was called the Legend of the White Cow for some reason. So the other the other two were sort of no longer worthy. So God, for some reason, was deciding to move it to to Moscow, which is you know probably probably a great thing to hear if you're the Tsar. But uh, 
Well, uh, do you know why the Russians chose the Orthodox Church? I've heard the legend, but it'd uh, be interesting to hear what exact version you've heard of it. My understanding was that uh, when... I forgot who it was, but um, when they were deciding what their official religion should be, they met with um, like uh, Judaism and Roman Catholicism and and uh, like Muslims and they picked Orthodox because the head of the country is the, also head of the church. Oh, okay. That is a much more prosaic uh, explanation. <laughs> um, yeah, as definitely they have uh, the Eastern Roman Empire had a kind of, I guess it's technically referred to as Cesaro papism, where, yeah, there's mm-hmm. this sort of kind of the emperor has a religious role as well in the in a way it's a bit more separated in, in, in Catholic countries. Uh, the, the more colourful version that I've heard is that um, the Russian emissaries just weren't all that impressed by the church services um, from hmm. uh, the from Latin or you know Roman Christianity. So they're just like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas Judaism was rejected because the Jews no longer possessed their holy city. So it's like, well... Okay, so um, if they don't even have their own most important place, then there's not that much power in it. And then supposedly Islam was was rejected uh, because they didn't let you drink alcohol. So um, um, that is true. <laughs> um, <laughs> and supposedly uh, Vladimir, who was the prince who mm-hmm. converted the uh, the Russians officially. Um, or said, this is what we're going to be from now on, uh, is supposed to have said that drink is the joy of the Russians, which, um, <laughs> again, it's, it's uh, you know, you're kind of playing into your own uh, stereotypes there. Um, I guess the vodka has always been a big thing there. Um, I don't know that specifically vodka. I think I think that hmm. that was actually a bit more of a, a thing that they they picked up on on later, I think hmm. that uh, mead was was the big like high middle middle ages thing that they drank, and I think oh. uh, vodka was a was a, a bit of a later development. But um, yeah, incidentally, um, the word vodka is 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 very close to the Russian word uh, for water, um, which is vada is just normal <laughs> water, and and ka like typically. Um, is like a little diminutive. Um, so you mm-hmm. could almost say that vodka means something like little water or nice little water or something like that. Um, hmm. But yeah, actually, this is something that won't come up too much. Um, in It's just a nightmare for people doing the subtitles. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, quite often when Ivan in the film is referring to people, he's not mm-hmm. referring to them by their exact given name. He's... Uh, he's referring to them as, for example, Philip. Um, instead of Philippe, mm-hmm. he's Philippe Ka, which it's like, it's a bit of an odd diminutive because it's not always, it sometimes can be affectionate, but it can also be like derisory. Mm-hmm. So that's one of those things. It's, it's an extra little nuance that you get, but if you're subtitling it, you may as well not bother just because people are not necessarily going to understand why that's there, so... Oh, okay. Yeah, Russian diminutives, is, that just makes the name seem more complex. Oh, yes. Yeah. I tried reading the Brothers Karamazov, and that was just dense. Yeah, yeah. Because you're like, who is that that they're talking about again? I mean, <laughs> once once you get the hang of it, and living mm-hmm. in Russia for a while, you kind of... you have to. But mm-hmm. uh, if you're just coming at it cold, it does make things a little bit more uh, more complicated. Um, was that a pun? Sorry? Was that a pun? The cold? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> not intentionally, but... Uh, um, all right, then. So uh, I think we should probably um, wrap this one up. But before we do, I would just uh, ask you a few things. Like, is this a film that you would recommend to other people? I would recommend it if you're interested in history, or uh, especially Russian history. But if you want to see like, a good biopic on someone who I think is misunderstood in pop culturally, this is a good a good movie to see. It's good production. I like the pacing. It's edited well. You don't feel the two hours. Um, yeah, it's 
it's a good solid movie. It's a little repetitive with like the the Philip and Ivan scenes where they're going back and forth about uh, the whole going too far and it gets kind of annoying as it goes on, but uh it, it's it's definitely worth worth seeing. Okay, cool. I mean I'd say yes, would recommend, but you know, if it's a Friday night and you just wanna watch something to chill out with Maybe pick something else, as this is there's some there's some pretty uh, brutal stuff going on. So it's it's not necessarily going to make you feel better. <laughs> um, yeah. No. <laughs> okay. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Spencer. You've been a, a wonderful and a extremely knowledgeable guest. So it's been really great to bring that uh, expertise to bear on the on the discussion of the film. Oh, thank you. I've never been called an expert. It's yeah, no, it's it's really it's really great. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but before we go, is there anything you'd like to make people aware of? Let's see. I have a podcast called High and Low, a Kurosawa podcast that you have been on talking about the Kurosawa film, The Lower Depths, based off the Gorky play. And um, in my in the podcast, uh, me and my co-host Joel will pair a Kurosawa movie with another Japanese movie from that same year. And uh, just compare and contrast the themes and all that stuff. We, we aren't film experts. We're just fans. So it, it's a definitely more casual. It's not like a deep film theory thing. We're just hanging out, looking for an excuse to watch Japanese movies, which was the whole point of the podcast to begin with. And um, I've been on the podcast uh, School of Schlock talking about this interesting kung fu movie called Return of Kung Fu Dragon. It's School of Schlock episode 26, and I was on the podcast of Grindbin talking about this very challenging satire about the history of black people in America called Coonskin from uh, Grindbin episode 74, and... That just sounds challenging just from the title. I kind of like, oh, I'm not sure what I'm going to make of that. <laughs> it's... I like the movie. It's just a very odd experience to sit through. But it's 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 well intentioned. It's supposed to make you uncomfortable. It's playing up on racist stereotypes. That's the whole point of the movie. So if that makes you uncomfortable, it's doing it's doing its job. And I write for some knife fight. I review old TV shows and TV movies. And I just did one called Baffled. It was a BBC TV movie secret pilot where Leonard Nimoy plays a Formula One driver who has. Uh, the power of foresight, and so he uses that to help solve crimes. Oh, wow. And so, yeah, it's on YouTube in a couple places. It's on DVD. It's this very odd BBC thing they did in the 70s. That's a whole lot of fun. It does definitely sound, yeah, like a very <laughs> 70s yeah, kind of idea. Plus, you know, always good to, to see um, Leonard Nimoy in something... Uh, besides uh, besides Spock as well, because that's pretty much all I've seen him in, so that would be interesting. Yeah, I highly recommend uh, the TV movie Baffled and also read my review on uh, Some of Knife Fight. Oh, cool. And um, uh, do you have a Twitter handle at all? Uh, my my Twitter is my podcast Twitter, at High and Low Pod. Cool. So we can, yeah, get in touch with you, with you that way. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, you will be on High and Low again for The Idiot. That's that's the plan, yeah. So, uh, you know, so if you thought uh, that Tsar was a barrel of laughs, hmm. just uh, just wait till you uh, yeah see that one. Yeah, that's a that's a difficult movie <laughs> to put it lightly. I haven't seen it yet, but I've uh, but I've read the the Dostoevsky novel that it's adapted from, and um, yeah, um, there's not as there's not as much violence as there is in Tsar, but it's 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 not. Uh, it's not a fun, happy time, but then you should kind of know that if you know anything about Dostoevsky. Yeah. So. Well, the original Kurosawa's first cut was five and a half hours. Wow. He cut it down to two hours, 45 minutes. So it's it's a, just a bizarre, challenging adaptation. It's very well made. It's just, it's like his, it's his stalker. Hmm. Okay. Wow. 
um, which, yeah, having reviewed Stalker <laughs> earlier on, yeah, um, in this podcast, uh, you should check out that episode, uh, for some more in- insight into what that might, might mean if you haven't seen, mm-hmm. uh, Tarkovsky's Stalker before. So, yeah, so it sounds like we're in for a, a, a treat with that one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks again, Spencer. Well, you're welcome. And dust for Daniel, folks. Thanks again for listening. If you'd like to get in touch with the show, you can do that on Twitter at RoosterFilesU. So that's the word RoosterFiles and the letter U. Also, there's a RoosterFiles Unite group on Facebook. Or you can email me at RoosterFilesUnite at gmail.com. Bye for now. Bye for now.